Good afternoon and welcome. This is Africa Speaks. And 31 years ago, on a sunny afternoon like today's, cries from an airstrip in Wajir finally fell silent. The military called in to respond to the killing of four civil servants had completed what was the most brutal operation in the living history of the residents of Wajir, particularly the Dagodia clan. There is no accurate record of how many people have, had been murdered on, that, on those four days. Although, according to the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation report on what is now known as the Wagala Massacre, over a thousand people were killed. Today on Africa Speaks, we talk about those four days in Wajir with one of the first people to chronicle them, author of Blood on the Runway, Salah Abdi Sheikh. But first, let's get into Web City. Today, the international press community breathes a sigh of temporary relief after the release on bail of Al Jazeera journalists, Egyptians, Mohammed Fahmi and Baher Mohammed. The two had been held for over 400 days on allegations of spreading false propaganda, conspiring with the Muslim Brotherhood and endangering national security. Their retrial is set to begin towards the end of this month. And initially, Fahmi had been sentenced to serve seven years in prison, with Baher sentenced to serve 10 years in prison. They waited in anticipation, and when the ruling was delivered, Muhammad Bahmoud Fadil Fahd. A loud applause rented the packed courtroom. Emotions ran high. We've learned a lot during this, uh, in this experience, and we've learned that freedom doesn't, there is a big high price for freedom. After spending more than 400 days in prison, the two jailed Al Jazeera journalist Mohammed Fami, a Canadian, and his colleague, Egyptian, Baher Mohammed, pending retrial, will now walk free. Their Australian colleague Peter Grester was freed and deported home earlier this month under a law allowing the deportation of foreign nationals to their home countries to stand trial or serve out their sentences. Fami has also decided to renounce his Egyptian citizenship, which means that while he might be lucky and get deported, an acquittal is the only hope for his colleague Mohammed, who has no other nationality. The three were imprisoned in December 2013 and were accused of spreading false news about Egypt, helping a terrorist group and operating without a permit. They had been sentenced for between 7 and 10 years each. But in January 2015, Egypt's Court of Cassation ruled that the lower court lacked evidence to support its ruling in the original verdict. The arrests and detentions of the journalists have sparked worldwide condemnation, but for now, the tension is expected to cool down until the two appear in court again on February 23rd. <laughs> All right, before we get into click, there is some breaking news. As you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a forceful shutdown of at least three media houses in the country by the Communication Authority. The shutdown is of their analog signals following an order by the Communication Authority that was received by newsrooms yesterday evening that the switch-off deadline would be midnight last night. Now, this follows uh, quite a long period in terms of court drama between the communication authority and these three media houses. And despite the fact that the media houses won the right to broadcast digitally, the communication authority had moved forward that shutdown deadline. And this is also in spite of the fact that the ADN had communicated their own, um, their, had communicated to the communication authority, a communication which was ignored by the communication authority. So if you are still receiving us, this is breaking news happening right now. Three, at least three media houses that are on the analog signal, that is Citizen TV, NTV, as well as KTN, are being forcefully shut down by the communication authority. We will update you on that if we still can, of course, on our analog signals in subsequent bulletins as well as within this bulletin as and when we get more information. Now let's move on with what's happening in Africa Speaks. And there, may, there are many differences between the armed forces of Western countries and those in Africa, but a pair of Nigerian comedians shows us just what they think of how the U.S. Army compares to the Nigerian Army. Take a look. Yeah. Oh, 
Papua and they miss. Oh boy, who are you telling me? It, it don't vex me tire. If Nigeria don't enter second round, oh, this okay. country where they fight for. Oh. If you don't enter second round, uh, you don't say my father be one of you. Okay. 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 Now don't be that too. No, okay. Now don't be that too. Now don't come back. No, you don't need. No, I don't. No, I don't want that. You okay. don't need. Okay. They will kill us. Okay. Let's let's see that bad guy. Go, go, go here. Okay, what do you mean? Go here. What do you mean? You can't go. You don't have this country. You can't. You, can. you don't have this country. Okay, leave that thing, bro. If you, want, if you want to send me, anywhere you want to send me, you will go first and follow you. No, I don't know, General. Okay, okay. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, my wife is pregnant. Okay. Let's see. Listen. Hey, bro. Hey, hey. I have two young boys. They're on the call. I have two young boys. Come on. I have two young boys. Come here, where are you going? Okay, I have two young boys. Okay, come on, go. This boy is leaving me. Okay. Okay, let's go. A little comic relief there before we get into a very serious subject this afternoon. Of course, this is 31 years to the end of what was four days in Wajir that became, have come to be known as the days under which the Wagala massacre took place. It isn't known how many people died, although there are estimates of over a thousand by the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. The government, the official government statistic on the number of people that died in the, during the Wagala massacre is 57. But there's a man here who was among the first to chronicle what happened from the stories of people who survived those four days in 1984 and wrote the book Blood on the Runway. His name is Salah Abdi Sheikh. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon on Africa Speaks. Very inaus inauspicious time um, in terms of memory, in terms of the living memory of many of the people who are in Wajir. Of course, also joining us um, on phone later on in, the, in this show is Faisal Abdul, Abdul Rahman. He's our correspondent in Wajir. Get us, give, give us an update on what's happening with regard to commemoration on the day. But Faisal, let me, uh, sorry, um, Salah, let me just start with you. And um, this is from the preface of your book. And you say very striking words to someone who, who, who's reading this book as a person who doesn't understand the context. He says, this book has little entertainment value. It's not an earth-shaking masterpiece. It's not a thriller. And it certainly may not have any literary value. This book in many places reads like a project proposal or just a narration of an event without emphasis on style. To many people, this book is just restating what they already know about the Wagala massacre. Do you still believe those words today, well, not with respect to how you penned the book, but with respect to the narrative itself, that you are being true to the narrative of, of what, what took place in those four days? Yeah, mostly yes, because uh, the book is based on uh, over 20 something years of living with the, with the victims themselves. Yeah. yeah. Because where I come from, that's what, where it happened. Uh, in my own family, about seven people definitely died within that uh, extended family. Uh, I grew up with the orphans mm -hmm. whose fathers were killed. So the, the book grew out of the, the experiences I had personally and the interviews I had with the with, with, with the with the with the victim, with the survivors yeah uh, so uh, it's up, up, i still believe the book is the narration of the book is uh, is uh, is correct i think it actually it didn't it didn't go far enough mm -hmm. it didn't go far enough because much of what we know now we didn't know then because we, the tgrc and us a lot of information which we didn't have we were relying on uh, information collected by activists of our period of, of time. Yeah. But we didn't have the minutes, the, you know, a lot of information that we got later uh, from, uh, from, uh, from TGRC. So the book is actually due for, for revision yeah. so that now it, it updates uh, the, uh, you know, those the, the other things that, that we, 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 we didn't, didn't cover. Have. But at the time we were writing, we were not writing because we were writing a book. You know, if you want to write a book, uh, uh, for instance, a novel, a, a current event book, an academic book, which, uh, you know, which has certain style, adherence to certain, um, uh, you know, gu guidelines. But this was more like communicating what happened in 1984 yeah. in the best way we could. All right. In just the best way we could. Before we get into some of the controversies around the numbers, let's just um, paint a picture 
uh, you you quite rightly say that you lived with people who were orphaned by uh, during the Wagala massacre. Paint a picture of what it was like on those four days for perhaps the few Kenyans who do not know about this. I think it was it can be described as hell on earth because if you are put in a very big uh, uh, airstrip uh, on a white gravel, newly built. Uh, and then you are denied water and food and the temperature is around 40 degrees then you can expect you know that kind of environment how, how it will be yeah. and uh, most and they were kept naked for four days without food without water without any help and with with torture mm -hmm. so it was uh, probably the worst thing the worst kind of treatment a human being could actually do yeah and eventually they couldn't even continue to endure and they had to run and when they ran they were shot at and you know they they had even these people who were injured you know there was no medical attention and after that they collected everybody injured you know and dead and anybody who was uh, you know who was uh, you know suffering because of, of of the thirst and the hunger and they put them in very far places you know just actually they threw them like garbage yeah, yeah into very far places so that they, they nobody could, could recover them so many people actually did not die because of being killed, they actually die, uh, being actually shot or being uh, tortured to death, they actually died because of lack of food, yeah. or lack of water, and no help. Now, when you heard that the official number of people who had died during those four days was 57, how did that make you feel as a person who has grown up with that being constantly told to him as a narrative by people who survived the Wagala massacre? Uh, the first thing we looked at is how many civil servants died? Before even we go to, before we go to the other people, you can ask the government, how many of your people died? How many of your employees died? And they're around 55. So you're telling us they're 57. 55 of them are your employees. So did you go around killing, targeting your employees for, 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 for that massacre? Yeah. So I think it does make sense. It does make sense because the people I know are more than 57. Mm -hmm. The people I know personally, they, they, you know, the community, if I, if I go around and you know, I start naming them, uh, more than 57. So you're telling me it's 57, and uh, at the time, you see, you, it couldn't have been 57, it couldn't have been 100, it couldn't have been 500, it couldn't even have been 1,000. Yeah. Because you collected every member of the Degodia community, a community now in Kenya is around 450,000 people, uh, and uh, you, you, you collected everybody you could find in that town. Ujiri town probably you have seen, it's a very big, it's not a small town. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, you, could, you, you were telling us in the end you killed 57 people. And even if you killed 57 people, for what reason did you kill them? Mm -hmm. What was the reason you killed 57 individuals, 57 Kenyans, 57 innocent people? Yeah. yeah. In fact, what will be the reason for killing one person? That, so that, yeah. it, it, it doesn't help them in any way. It doesn't make, them, make it easier. It doesn't make it uh, an explainable you know, uh, you know, situation. Yeah. It makes it even worse. You are accepting that you killed 57 people. For what? True. Let's, yeah. let's leave it there before we go into a break just now. On Africa Speaks, very heavy conversation that we're having here uh, about an event that happened over four days in 1984, in February 1984. That, of course, is known today as a Wagala massacre. We're talking about it with Salah Abdi Sheikh. He's the author of Blood on the Runway, one of the first books to have chronicled what took place from the experiences of people who lived through those four horrendous days. We'll be getting into what the TGRC said vis-a-vis -vis whether anything is happening with, as concerns compensation and being able to move forward. But before we do, I'd like to invite you, of course, to uh, contribute on the hashtag. That's KTN Africa Speaks on my, ha on my Twitter handle, at John Alanamu, or on the Twitter handle of the show, at KTN Africa Speaks. Before we go into that break, there is some breaking news right at the bottom of the screen, scrolling at the bottom of your screen, about that forceful shutdown of at least three media houses that have not yet converted their analog signals to a digital signal, that being enforced by the communication authority. Some of the read broadcasting sites like in Limuru have been raided forcefully by the communication authority of Kenya um, following their order that midnight, following midnight last night, that analog signals ought to be shut off. We'll try and continue updating you with as much as we can for as long as we can because we don't know when we're going to be pulled off of the air. This is KTN Africa Speaks. Back in a moment.
Welcome back, and if you're just joining us, this of course is Africa Speaks, and we are commemorating 31 years since the Wagala massacre in Wajir, 1984, for four days between the 10th and the 14th of February. Hun thousands of people from the Dagodia clan were gathered together by the military at the Wajir airstrip, tortured many of them, hundreds, possibly thousands, at least according to the TJRC report, have been killed, their bodies not found. With us today is the author of Blood on the Runway, Salah Abdi Sheikh, one of the first chronicles of what happened through the eyes of people who lived through that horrendous time. And I'm just getting into some of your feedback before we continue with our conversation. Oliver Mutai says, it's good the author told the story plainly instead of literally playing around the story. Um, Alamin Kimathi also tuning in says, Blood on the Runway author um, is now on, on, on uh, KTN speaking. Of course, playfully talking about it being before the shutdown. We hope that at least this show and many others will be able to complete before the shutdown, the forceful shutdown by the Communication Authority of Kenya. But let's get back into this conversation. Salah, we were just about to get into um, what the government has been saying vis-a-vis -vis what people on the ground have experienced. And you talked about there not being any connection to the statistics that have been given with respect to the number of dead. But let's move away from that for a moment to the TJRC report. The TJRC report, like you said, unveiled, uncovered quite a number of things, including that possibly over a thousand people, even though they were indefinite, had been killed. But do you think that the, uh, there was any value to saying that and penning it um, and making it part of a narrative when nothing to date apart from there being a, a commemorative plaque, has been done? I think the TJRC report, uh, we had very little faith in it initially. You remember there was the court yeah. case, there was the credibility of the chairman, there was a lot of problems. But what came out, uh, although not what we expected, not 100% what we expected, is something that we can live with, something that we think is quite next to the truth, quite near the, truth, the full truth. And the recommendations are...